This episode is supported by FX's Grotesquerie, a new series from executive producer Ryan Murphy. Heinous crimes unsettle a small community, and the local detective feels these atrocities are eerily personal, as if someone or something is taunting her. Starring Nisi Nash Betts, Courtney B. Vance, Leslie Manville, and Travis Kelsey. FX's Grotesquerie premieres September 25th on FX. Stream on Hulu. It's time for Tuesday Terror, here on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that all children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. You're listening to Audio Theater in a Darker Shade. This is DarkerProject.com. And now, our feature presentation. The following audio is explicit in nature and may contain adult themes, light sexual situations, violent content, or strong language. in a time when the end of the world was just the beginning of a nightmare. When the worst of us set the world to burn while the best of us cower in terror. Tonight's presentation, Madness. Episode 4, Home is Where the Heart is Lost. Written by Andrew T. J. Rowe. Previously on Madness. So you have three. Okay, so that means the safety's off then, right? Is the button red? Uh, no. Then it's ready to fire. Just make sure to hold it tight against your shoulder, or it's gonna bruise the shit out of you. Do you think there's more rounds in the. Wait, where's Ronnie? Fuck if I know. Look, there's a farmhouse. Do you think he's... Going to get his ass killed? Yeah, I do. Come on, maybe they have a car. Jared. What? You think I'm crazy too, don't you? I... no, I, I didn't say... It's okay. I'm not entirely sure that you're wrong. I mean, I killed Steve, Kevin, and that cashier was a little prick. But I should be feeling something about all that, right? Yeah... So maybe I am crazy. Not, you know, like Steve and Farmer John's girl, but neither was Kevin, and we both know he was crazy, right? Yeah. You know, I think I can live with all that. But are you so sure that you aren't crazy too? What? There's an old pickup outside. I found the keys under the seat. Get your gun. We're wasting daylight. I gathered the box of ammo Chris had found in the car and stuffed them into my pocket. I felt a warm sense of comfort as I wrapped my hand around the cold wooden grip of the shotgun. Maybe I was crazy, but I was armed, and if I'd counted correctly, Chris was out of bullets. The clock on the dashboard said 7.51, almost eight hours since everything had begun. My head hurt where the shotgun had recoiled into it, and all of my thoughts hovered on the edge of panic. Panic 
for Melissa, for Ellie, for myself. Paranoid? I still thought that was an overstatement. Panic seemed to be exactly what the situation called for. And all things considered, I'd like to think I'd kept my cool. But with a few hours of sleep, and possibly with thanks to a minor concussion, I still found it difficult to focus on anything. Anything other than those shadowy phantoms of panic. God damn it, not again. We passed the sun-cracked green sign that said, Welcome to Sofer, Kansas, but didn't get any further. A dozen or more cars were piled up across the road and into ditches as if there had been a demolition derby right at the city limits. We can drive around it in the ditch, right? I'm not sure that's a good idea. Someone did this on purpose. So... So that someone might still be around, and this truck is loud as hell. We might as well drive down Main Street with a loudspeaker screaming, Come and get us. So... what then? Are you suggesting we walk? You got a gun. What are you worried about? We can't walk. That's... I swear to God, if you say crazy, I'm going to knock your ass out again. It isn't safe. If you wanted safe, you should have stayed at Farmer John's. Damn it, Chris! All right, all right, but if we're walking, we should go down by the railroad depot. It'll be faster than going through downtown, and there shouldn't be anyone out that far. Downtown is exactly where I'm going. What? Why? I need to check up on my shop. Make sure it's still standing. Who cares? I need to find my wife and daughter, Chris. Then you do that, Jared. We need to stay together. We we need to make sure... You got Melissa and Ellie, and I got my shop. That's exactly where I'm going, and you're welcome to tag along if you want to. No. (laughs) Are you pointing that shotgun at my back, Jared? We're going to find Melissa and Ellie. Well, I'll be damned. You kill one little girl, and suddenly you've got a big brass pair. I didn't think you had it in you. You think any farmer in Kansas doesn't have a gun in his house? I mean, it's no shotgun, but I think a thirty-eight would be enough to bring you down, Jared. Jared, I I know you don't want to shoot me. I really wish I could say the same, but the, the truth is, I just don't care. Fine. Go then. Offer still stands, Jared. You're welcome to tag along. At that moment, I almost abandoned all hope. I told myself that Melissa and Ellie were either somewhere safe, or, well, that another hour wouldn't make a difference. As Chris walked away, I felt like a kid taking out the trash after dark, imagined terrors nipping at my heels and I wanted desperately to run after him at a dead sprint. Melissa. Ellie. I turned toward the gravel road on the south edge of town and started toward the train depot. Downtown Soffer, Kansas where all of my memories were made. My first kiss on the bench outside of the drugstore with Beth Ann Reese. She was probably dead now. My first job stocking shelves in my father's liquor store. He'd been dead for almost a year. My first car wreck when blind old Mrs. Tuttle ran the stop sign at Maine and Central. God, I hope that old bitch was dead. And I didn't give a half a shit about any of it. I didn't give a shit about the big, nonsensical mural painted by local grade schoolers on the bare brick wall of the pizza parlor, or that it had been defaced with runny red spray paint that read, Say oink, little piggies. Whatever the hell that meant. I didn't give a shit about the bullet holes in the bank's front window, or the pools and streaks and splatters of drying blood on the sidewalk. Hell, 
I barely noticed the old man with a meat cleaver in his bald skull. Or the teenage girl that, at least I, I think it was a teenage girl. There wasn't much left but a few mounds of rotting meat and a pair of bloody tire tracks down the sidewalk. Even the 14 neighborhood dogs that had been strung up like Christmas lights over the power lines didn't faze me. I used to love dogs. But when I saw my shop passed down from my father to me, a jeep parked among the ruined remains of the glass door front, and a hundred gallons of moderately priced wine pouring out into the storm drain? <laughs> well, I didn't give a shit about that either. yoo who? Anyone here? Guess not. There wasn't much point in using the door, so I just stepped through the hole that someone's wrangler had punched in the wall. The store was ransacked, and I found myself automatically running numbers in my head. Ten thousand dollars for the cheap wine display that the Jeep had toppled. Maybe another twenty for the broken and missing whiskey off the shelf. Rum and vodka. <laughs> well, well, by then I figured that my insurance agent was probably dead also. Good riddance to that annoying prick. I took a bottle of Jack off the shelf and poured it warm into a shot glass I kept under the counter for tastings. I didn't want to shoot it particularly, so I sipped it slowly and poured another. There was a time that I enjoyed the slow spread of warmth in my belly, but I didn't find it this time, just the acidic burn of alcohol in my throat. I wondered if crazy people could get drunk. As much as I hated to admit it, Jared was right. I was definitely crazy. <laughs> I leaned against the checkout counter and continued to sip whiskey while I pondered exactly where my life had ended up. A flutter of movement from outside, wisps of white silk twirling in the morning breeze. A woman in a wedding gown danced in the street like a ballerina making lazy twirls across the stage. I recognized her, but couldn't call her by name. I only knew her as the pretty late thirties lady who bought two pouches of frozen daiquiri on Wednesday nights and a handle of rum on Saturday afternoon. She used to come in with her husband every couple of weeks for a bottle of top-shelf wine or champagne. Her taste had moved to lower shelves after her wedding ring vanished and her partner stopped coming in with her. I took another sip as I watched three bloodied men and a woman descend on her like a pack of rabid dogs. They were like Steve, I guess, suddenly made bloodthirsty in the night. I thought for sure they were going to kill her, but they didn't. She laughed like Kevin had laughed as two of them hefted her up and carried her away like a prized buck to do any number of terrible things they might have had in mind. As they disappeared from view around the corner of the shop, I dimly thought it would probably have been better for her if they'd killed her on the spot. And then I remembered. I didn't give a shit. I downed the rest of the glass and looked at an oversized cardboard cutout of Captain Morgan standing proudly with his foot atop a wooden barrel. Well, Captain, what the fuck do I do now? I have only the vaguest memory of walking along 29th Street, or what the locals called Baseball Road, in the grips of nervous terror. I hadn't been to the ball fields, at which Baseball Road terminated a quarter mile to the east, since I played t-ball in second grade. But on game nights, I could see the blazing lights and hear the cheering of the crowd from my back porch. The house, which Melissa and I had bought just two years earlier, was just beyond the eight-foot wooden privacy fence that separated my backyard and the train depot property. The old station had been called abandoned for as long as anyone could remember. It certainly looked abandoned, a brick-and-mortar edifice slowly crumbling into the dust of a long-forgotten era. But it had actually been repurposed into a storage facility for the city's work crews. I was sure there was nobody in the old depot, but that knowledge didn't stop me from keeping the shotgun tight against my shoulder and the barrel aimed at it as I passed. I tiptoed through the gravel parking lot in a half-crouch and imagined I might look like a severely underprepared Navy SEAL on a solo raid. I kept checking the trigger lock to make sure I hadn't accidentally engaged it with my thumb. Paranoid. I was just being paranoid. 
Of course there was nothing waiting to burst out of a boarded-up window to attack me as I made my way silently and far too slowly to the fence. I knew there was a loose board that I could slip through somewhere, which I had had every intention of fixing, you know, before the apocalypse. But it took me several minutes to find it from this unfamiliar side. The gun barrel went first into my backyard, pausing to sweep over the entire property, before I crept in myself. I didn't realize until I was within the confines of my yard's high wooden wall how exposed I had felt, how exposed I still felt just being outside under an open sky. The gate was closed, but had no lock, and I knew the back door's deadbolt would be open. It was never locked because we'd lost the key two weeks after we moved in. In fact, knowing Melissa as I did, her trusting and casual and too often naive personality, the front door probably wasn't locked either. Or any of the windows, for that matter. Just like at the backyard fence, the gun entered into the house first, slowly scanning for any threats. It was quiet, eerily so, and I had a sudden chill thinking of the farmer girl's piercing scream which had shattered the last moment of silence. The kitchen to which the door opened looked as pristine as it always did, elegant care taken by my still-nesting wife. It looked like... it felt like home. Melissa? No answer, of course. I couldn't bring myself to break the surreal, almost sacred silence with any more than a whisper. I entered the kitchen and closed the door as quietly as an old door could be closed. I poked my gun into the laundry room, empty. The bathroom, empty. The living room, the couch was set up as a guest bed. Had Melissa said something about her mother staying over? That thought didn't last long in my panicky brain, which focused instead on the wide open front door and the rusty red shoe prints. My wife's sneakers, tracking blood to the front step from the bedroom hallway. That sight got me moving faster than I should have for stealth's sake, and I rounded into the hallway. The footprints led right past the master bedroom and into the nursery. No, no, God, please, no. I rushed down the hallway, driven by my already heightened adrenaline, stealing myself for what I'd find in my daughter's room. Melissa lay on the floor, face down in her own blood. Ellie was nowhere to be seen. They'd taken her, my beautiful baby girl. Those monsters had murdered my wife and taken my baby. Shock overtook me, shutting down my writing brain, dulling my senses, and moving my legs forward. It was over. Everything was over. My life was over. I was going to lay down next to my wife and wait until killers or cannibals or the goddamn devil himself came to take care of me. Those beautiful red curls, blending into the blood like an illusion. I'd always said you'd never be able to tell Melissa and her mother apart from behind. And it wasn't until I was much closer that I realized that this wasn't Melissa Carvey lying dead on the floor. It was Frances Barkley, my mother-in-law. It hit me like a speeding bus. Melissa wasn't dead. Those were her footprints in the hallway running through the front door, those sensible sneakers that she'd worn since her feet had started swelling during pregnancy. Maybe Frances had gone crazy. Like Steve. Maybe she'd tried to hurt Ellie and Melissa had done what any mother would have. They were alive. I was sure of it. And I had to find them. I gathered myself and re-entered the hallway where I froze in mid-step. I didn't recognize him immediately. 
Mr. Iverland, our elderly next-door neighbor. His face was swollen and disfigured by bruises around his eyes where strange spine-like growths protruded in his bloody orbits. It was the tiny, atrophied frame of the old man and the faint hints of thread-like gray hair that I finally recognized. He was facing me, though not entirely. Whatever it was growing out of his eyes had obviously blinded him. Those spiky growths twitched back and forth as he stood listening. He had me cornered. No escape except into Ellie's bedroom with its one window, which I was sure I couldn't get through before he was on me. I thought about the shotgun, but its ear-splitting blast would alert the whole neighborhood, and how far would I get then? Damn it! He had been in Melissa and I's bedroom. If I had just checked, I could have trapped him inside. That's when the plan formed. Mr. Iverland crept toward me, snuffling the air like a dog smelling for prey, his head making slow arcs to alternate listening ears in my direction. One spindly arm stretched out to trace against the wall of the narrow corridor. I flattened myself against the wall slowly, careful not to make a sound, and fished a single shotgun shell from the box in my pocket. As he approached, I found myself morbidly transfixed on the growths in his dead eyes. They were sharp, brown and bloody splinters like rotten bone, four in one eye, three in the other. They almost looked like, and they were. As he came within arm's reach, I could see clearly. They were toothpicks. Nothing on earth compares to the putrid smell of the pus leaked from a ruptured eyeball, and I realized that this was the second time in as many days that I had smelled it. Steve had likewise mutilated himself, only with a fish hook instead of toothpicks. I vaguely registered the connection before I tossed the shotgun shell onto the hardwood floor in Ellie's room. I spilled through the living room and onto the porch, slamming the front door behind me. I backed away and raised the shotgun in case the dead woman in my daughter's room wasn't enough to distract him. A few seconds ticked by, and I turned with the full intention of running until my legs gave out, but something in the street stopped my frantic flight from the house. It looked so alien, so wrong that my brain took its sweet time processing that it was a woman. She was a macabre kind of beautiful, with streaming tangles of jet black hair framing her sharp features. She wore the tattered remains of denim jeans on her lower half, and nothing above that but a glaze of thick crimson that covered her face and bare torso. She made no move toward me, no move at all, in fact. She just stood like a statue, her wide, angular eyes staring as if she were trying to absorb the sight of me as I absorbed the sight of her. A gunshot. Then, impossibly fast, and with the grace of a startled gazelle, she was gone, across the street and over the neighbor's hedge. Damn it. I thought it was getting better. Was that Mary Kwan, the kindergarten teacher? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it was. Wow, I never realized how hot she was. I mean, she needs a bath, but wait a second. Bloody Mary? You know, because she... Eh, screw it. Did you find your wife and kid? No. No, they aren't here. Your car's gone? They must have gone somewhere else. Yeah, I think we should do the same. They probably heard the gunshot. Train station's still all boarded up, right? Yeah. Good a place as any to hold up. Lead the way. We walked away from my house, my home, where Melissa had nursed our baby and killed her mother, whose corpse was probably serving as a meal for Mr. Iverland. I couldn't help but feel like I was walking away from my entire life, like I'd never find another place to call home. Melissa? Ellie? Where are you?
listening to Darker Project's production of Madness, Episode 4, The Home is Where the Heart is Lost, written by Andrew T. J. Rowe. Featured in this episode were Persephone Rose as Jared Carvey, Shane Harris as Chris Larson, Sarah Golding as The Woman and Bloody Mary, Joe Stofko as Mr. Iverland, and yours truly as the announcer. Madness is written and created by Andrew T. J. Rowe and was produced by M.J. Cockburn. The musical score was performed by Celestial Aeon Project. The executive producer for Darker Projects is MJ Cogburn. This has been a Darker Projects production. Visit us on the web at www.darkerprojects.com. This is Mark Brzee. Thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Tracy Babian, co-author of the Carlson Chronicles podcast. My husband, J.A. Babian, the main author, had a triple stroke in the latter part of August of this year. Jerry was lifelighted to Tulsa, Oklahoma, with a brain bleed that the doctors thought they were going to have to do surgery on him, which surely would have killed him. Thank the Lord they didn't. He survived that brain bleed and swelling, but he is in need of so much for his recovery I have started a GoFundMe to help with all the costs that I just don't have. I retired back in April of this year so that I could take care of Jerry, as he was starting to show signs then that I just didn't catch. Little did I know this would be a blessing in disguise. He is fighting this setback of memory loss and 75% use of his right leg, arm, along with his cognitive speech. Considering the doctor said he would not make it, I consider him to be a miracle. Medicare has only granted 12 visits of physical and speech therapy twice a week. He needs at least six months worth of speech therapy alone. That is a total of $4,000 we need to pay up front that I just don't have. So far, we have had $775 in donations of the $10,000 we need come in. Please donate today so that he can get his needed medication, therapy, and also help pay bills that Medicare just will not cover, even if it's only $5. I update this account so folks can see his progress. You can go to my Facebook account, Tracy Babian VO, to find the pinned link with the title Jerry Babian Stroke Victim Needs. Jerry says, thank you. I still have a lot to write on my stories that I want to get done. Please help me to achieve that goal. Thank you in advance for your donation. Tracy Babian.